Hello everyone, I'm Alexander Rose, the Executive Director here at Long Now. I'm so excited to have so many member speakers with us today for this Ignite format. The Ignite format was co-founded by Brady Forrest, who's also going to be our host today. With that, I'll hand it off to Brady. Welcome, Brady Forrest. Thanks, Sander. It's, uh, it's really great to be back here at the Long Now. This is our third Ignite with the Long Now, where we bring in members. And Ignite is designed to be a place where everybody gets to speak. Every one of these speakers gets five minutes on Zoom with 20 slides, 15 seconds a slide. And so it is ideal for someone who is a beginning speaker, but it is also the type of thing that can elevate an advanced speaker. And uh, I think you'll see a lot of that today. So please welcome our first speaker talking about nature and how it will work within our cities. She is an archeologist and professor at UCLA. Take it away, Monica L. Smith. Today, we might be focused on the long now, but what about the long ago? What are the archeological, paleontological, and geological sources of the dust to which we will all return? Or perhaps we're focused on the Anthropocene because it makes humans sound so important to have a geologic era named after us. Or maybe we're focused on the intersection between nature and culture, the things that we surround with a linearity, the ways that we bound nature to our will in ways that say, watch out. Something important is happening here for humans. I'm an archeologist and people are always asking me, where does the dirt come from? Why are archeologists always digging? And I ask them in return, why are you always sweeping? Because an archeological site begins when the last person puts down their broom and walks away. And those spaces in our built environment are the places where nature reinserts itself subtly in the interstices where new geologic layers can come from anything, from pollen, from dust, from bird droppings, even flowers. And these places in the interstices that you might not have noticed until just now are places that I started photographing a few years ago when I started thinking about where archeological sites come from. Most sites do not disappear overnight like Pompeii. They disappear in increments of dust, like Uruk or Jericho or Mohenjo-Daro or maybe they disappear in the tendrils of vegetation that subtly overwhelm the built environment, places like Tikal or Angkor or Yasha. And in those linearities of human intention where the plants grow, there are many more species of plants than there are species of human. And that archeology span is what becomes incrementally in the spaces that we thought we had designed for ourselves, but where nature and the plants were waiting to take over. It might appear as though nature conforms itself to the spaces where we allow it, but don't be fooled. It's just waiting to put in some spaces those unruly places, the little spots where the dust and the dirt and the plant seeds come in. It is as though nature is taking the opportunity to contrast itself with the linearity that we offer in our built environment, just waiting to implant itself in the places that we thought we controlled, like a dandelion 
masquerading as intentionality. These are not derelict places. Some of these images are from the most expensive zip code in America. Some of them are just a few feet away from one of the busiest intersections in the country. And these places where we think we have controlled, places where we put in a classification of space, of places that are curated or planted or free, are places where nature itself is just biding its time to come back to that sinuous intersection. Is it distressing or comforting to know how the Anthropocene ends? In every contest, large or small, nature always wins. Thank you. I certainly see it winning all over San Francisco on a daily basis. Where do you see it in LA? Everywhere underfoot. Now that you've seen it, you'll see it everywhere in the steps, in the cracks of the sidewalks, even in the traces of the freeway. I see now little bits of vegetation along the medians and the margins, even though there are thousands of wheels passing an hour, nature is still there. Yeah. Thank you for that meditation. It was great Thanks to have you me. here, Monica. And next up, we are joined by an American artist who's thinking of new rituals. Please welcome the creative director of Jumpstar, George Ferrandi. As an artist who spent most of my life in East Coast cities, I never really saw the stars until I spent some time in the mountains where the night sky was so spectacular, I bought a book by H.A. and Margaret Ray to help me understand what I was seeing. In it, I learned about axial precession, a very slow wobble in Earth's rotation that means while our polar axis currently points to Polaris, in a thousand years, it will point to another star. In other words, our literal and figurative guiding light, our North Star, which has come to symbolize the single thing that never changes, will change. But of course it will. The universe is change. What I want to know is, how will we commemorate that change? We have a huge party every time the Earth makes one rotation around the sun. Fancy clothes, sparkly drinks, we lament the past, predict the future, for an event that happens every year. Surely there'll be an unforgettable celebration to acknowledge the star that for centuries led ships to shore and enslaved people to freedom. Who will write the songs for that occasion? Will the UN organize a committee? Will NASA? Who will plan the party to say goodbye to our North Star? And when will they start? Which begs the question, what if it's us? And what if we start now? And this is the premise of Jumpstar, a multidisciplinary initiative that brings artists, musicians, and scientists together with communities to invent traditions that can be passed through the generations to say goodbye to Polaris and hello to Gamma Cephei. The whole project is named in honor of Annie Jump Cannon, the remarkable deaf Harford astronomer who established our star classification system, which was officially adopted 100 years ago this week. And the way it works is through a series of dream storming workshops we call constellates. Each constellate is dedicated to researching and inventing one aspect of future culture, a song, a healing ceremony, a celebratory snack. For our dance constellate in Kansas, for example, local performers working in a range of styles each contributed a gesture that our choreographer then incorporated into an experimental version of a barn dance, which is a style beloved in that particular region. For our future foods constellate, our climatologist explains how climate change will affect what agriculture will be viable in the region in a thousand years. And then participants work with local chefs to invent new recipes using those ingredients, like cricket flour to make chocolate chirp cookies. I've been researching all the stars that are in our cycle of future North Stars, 
and have developed characters for each of them based on how they're described by various cultures through history. And then with communities around the country, I'm designing and building ceremonial sculptures to represent these future North Stars using a te technique traditional in a Japanese festival called the Mabuta, which was itself once a star festival. The sculptures have lightweight wooden armatures and wire frames with paper skins, and they're illuminated from the inside. Clockwise from the left is Deneb, the Indestructibles, Theta Buddhist, AKA Boots, Thuban, and Vega. And they're all designed to be danced by teams of community participants we call dark matter, since dark matter is what holds up the stars. Here we have Polaris, Gamma Cephei, Ruffled Ethi Shemali, Alpha Waris, and Alderaman. And they were all to be part of Jump Star's inaugural ceremony in Kansas, but they haven't had their premiere yet. A few hours after our rehearsal and these photos, a tornado destroyed the surrounding tents. Somehow our tent and the very fragile paper sculptures survived unscathed, but only the Dark Matter volunteers have ever seen them in person. So we're still inventing the celebration and wondering where the first ever Jump Star ceremony will be, but we're not wondering why it's important. It can be easier to imagine apocalypse than to look to the future with hope. But as the Long Now community knows, our visions for the future are the very tools that will help us build it. Jumpstar offers the promise of a party and the celestial moment as playful strategies for forging those tools with the questions, what do we need to repair and prepare in the present before we can host the future? How do we get our house in order before the holiday? It lets us look forward with love to the resilient civilizations of the future, take action to ensure them a livable world, and plan the party that will celebrate their survival. Thank you so much for listening, and thank you to the Long Now for presenting. Thank you, George. When you were uh, creating this ritual, what are some of the ideas that you discarded? Oh my gosh. <laughs> well, the, the whole project kind of grows from the inside out. And so what makes it to the table is what has meaning to the people in the room. So what, what I select or discard isn't as important as kind of what we come to by consensus in each of the communities. All right. Well, thank you for being with us today, George. Thanks so much, Brady. All right. And now to talk about scientific revolutions is industrial artist, Matthew Dockery. Take it away. Hey. So in 1665, the world's oldest scientific journal, Philosophical Transactions, started publication. And for the last year, I've been working on a project where I read them, starting with issue number one. I dig up all the historical context I can for the articles, put it together, make a video about it, and post it. It's been a lot of work, but also a lot of fun, and I've learned some stuff that I thought I would share with you here. So it was a project of the Royal Society of London, one of their first big projects, actually. And their secretary, Henry Oldenburg, had long been the center of a kind of scientific pen pal network spanning Europe. And the journal was really a formalization of that. It uh, saved him the effort of handwriting out all the copies, I suppose. He mostly saw it as a way to make money on the side, but well, unfortunately for him, that never worked very well. Uh, but it worked pretty well for everyone else. But to really understand philosophical transactions, you have to go back even further in this, earlier in the century to Francis Bacon. He was a mildly corrupt court official who was absolutely convinced that uh, academics had been doing everything wrong for centuries. If you wanted to learn about the world, you had to do experiments. You couldn't just sit around and think about it really hard. In his book, The New Organon, he very explicitly says that we need to move away from deductive reasoning and embrace inductive reasoning instead. The, uh, the old satire about angels on the head of a pen, well, he didn't write it, but it was from his time and he probably would have approved. He even wrote a story called The New Atlantis about a fictional island kingdom at the center of which is Solomon's house, uh, which to a modern eye can only really be described as a research institute. They gather knowledge about the world, study it, 
and use it as the basis for further experiments. And by following this technique, the fictional kingdom has gained some really amazing technological powers, including well, what we would call televisions and submarines and recorded music. It's an oddly prophetic book in a lot of ways. But this was still a very centralized, very top-down understanding of science. Bacon thought that the project should be first to collect all the facts about the world, natural histories on fire and air and birds and everything. And once you've done that, it would probably only be the project of a couple years for people to go through and look at it all and figure out the rules and how the world works. Well, this was convincing enough that several decades later, some people were really trying to make it happen. The Royal Society grew out of a series of public lectures at Gresham College. Some public lectures not too unlike these, actually. And they were very explicitly trying to start Solomon's House. And a big part of that would be tools of communication, which is where the journal came in. Now, the first couple decades were pretty rough. They started just in time for the plague. And then they got back from that just in time for the Great Fire. And then Oldenburg was thrown into the tower under suspicion of being a Dutch spy. But it was also rough because they didn't know what they were doing. And that's really the joy out of reading the early issues, is that you get to see them inventing the very concept of scientific publication from issue to issue. Uh, the contents were also rough and kind of a mixed bag. Um, you get the earliest recorded um, record of the Great Red Spot of Jupiter, and it's next to a description of a deformed head of a monstrous calf. There are book reviews and trip reports and a lot of descriptions of mining technology. But for me, one of the other big joys is getting to see how different the actual process of the scientific revolution was compared to the stories we tell about it today. So take astronomy as an example. There are a lot of articles about cometary motion, and many of them end with a note to the effect that maybe this will help settle the grand question of the Earth's motion. Now, remember, we are 120 years after Copernicus at this point, and 30 years after Galileo. Those kind of paradigm shifts really have a much longer tail than history books usually indicate to us. When we're learning science, it's a very sanitized version with all the dead ends removed and presenting a nice linear narrative. But real science is messy and petty and weird, and it always has been. Now, the glory of science is that it works, even despite that. But they didn't know that at the time. They really thought they were forming uh, Solomon's house and would just sort of dispassionately argue about the facts and do experiments. And instead, they got confusion and infighting and a distinct lack of decorum. But they still generated the greatest engine for the de development of knowledge the world had ever seen. It wasn't what they intended, but it worked. And the communication of scientific results to the journal was a really integral part of that. By scaling up Oldenburg's pen pal network, they turned it into something completely different. It had made the private public, and it let science be more than just a hobby for rich weirdos. Um, and that's at least something I'm very thankful for. So basically, the scientific method works despite who's doing it. Exactly. Um, and I, we're just kind of lucky that they let it keep going, even though it really failed to live up to so many of their ideals beforehand. Which is your uh, favorite story from back then? Oh, um, there was this amazing exchange between Robert Hooke and this French astronomer, Adrien Azou. And Hooke had just published his magnificent book, Micrographia, which is just filled with these amazing illustrations. The flea in these slides is from that. It's a pretty famous image. But as also part of the book, like he got a chance to write a book. So he was going to put in everything he could. And one of the things he shoved in there was this idea he had for how to improve lens grinding, just a whole new mechanism for doing it. But he'd never actually tried it. He just like, here's what I think would work. And Azu writes into the journal saying, this really doesn't live up to our grand Baconian ideals of basing everything on personal experience and experimentation. And Hook just loses it at that uh, with some amazing vitriolic attacks and response, including an amazing argument that Azu was really the hypocrite because Azu hadn't done an experiment to prove the device wouldn't work. Um, and to me, that just really summarizes just how quickly things got pretty nasty, actually. And that's not even, of course, getting into the, the more famous disputes between uh, Newton and others later in the century. If someone wanted to read like a book on this topic, what would you recommend? Oh, that is a very good question. Um, I don't remember the name of it off the top of my head. I'm sorry. Um, there is one I am thinking of. Uh, 
and it's sitting behind me somewhere. Well, we'll follow up later and share it in the show notes. I will do Thank that. Thank you very much, Matthew. Thank you. And now to deliver a very timely talk, I'd like to welcome Thais and I, Derek. Thanks, Brady. Hello, my name is Thais Nyderich, and I am writing a novel set in the future. For my novel, I'm researching ectogenesis, which is my topic for today. Ectogenesis is the development of a mammalian embryo in an artificial environment. So since I'm a writer, I'm going to tell you a story as a way to explain it. And it begins in the year 2052. Kanya Kirchhoff is a pregnant 40-year-old PhD candidate. She wants to finish her thesis before her child is born. The title of her thesis is Ectogenesis. Is it as easy as one, two, three? At almost two months pregnant, Kanya writes a very strong chapter on the first researchers to successfully grow these lambs in bio bags from the human equivalent of 23 weeks to full term. Kanya wonders how she's gonna weave in when private funding started. She cites this tweet from Elon Musk, who's worried about population collapse and an advertising CEO's response, synthetic looms. Kanya's ring vibrates and she switches on her VR and walks into her doctor's appointment. Although natural birth is still technically legal, Kanya's doctor is shocked to see a six week old embryo on the ultrasound. In year 2052, it is barbaric to suffer through pregnancy. Her doctor reminds her of the safety of ectogenesis and the equality among genders and sexual minorities that it's given the world. This is all true, but Kanya just finished a chapter of the long ago cesarean section that increased at an alarming rate, not because of improved outcomes, but because of legal and economic conditions of the time. Was it just yesterday that Kanya opened her feed to see womb tech stock increase 50%? Kanya's friends enjoyed watching their fetuses grow on the live stream, but once they picked up their babies at the womb tech warehouses, they still struggled with uh, age old issues like um, affordable health care and child care and equal division of domestic labor. Nonetheless, her friends were surprised that Kanya decided to go against the mainstream. They asked her if she thought her body would remember how to give birth. They told her that she was brave. Kanya tried to remember when public opinion started to shift, and she found this date in 2021 when the International Society for Stem Cell Research lifted the 14-day limit on human embryo research. Kanya wrote about the first ex utero machines to grow mouse fetuses with a heartbeat, not much different from the ones developed by womb tech today. But in 2030, public opinion really shifted with these machines that started saving millions of premature infants as early as 23 weeks. Maybe Kanya was an outlier, but she thought her friends were the brave ones. Until synthetic eggs passed clinical trials, the eggs supporting Womb Tech Inc. were extracted from human bodies. How many injections did her friends agree to? Was it 60 hours of procedures and doctor's visits? Kanya wasn't convinced that ectogenesis was as easy as one, two, three. As unpopular as it was, Kanya wanted a natural birth. She wanted the benefits to her brain and her child's brain, and she really just wanted people to trust her ability to make good decisions for herself. As her pregnancy became noticeable, social and legal pressures increased. Her doctor threatened to call Child Protective Services unless she transitioned her pregnancy to an artificial womb. So Kanya was forced to hide, which proved very productive for her writing. She completed her thesis, and when her baby was born, she described it as 
pure reverence. Back at work, Kanya breastfed in the meditation room, a gift in 2052 that less than 1% of people could give their children. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Thais. Um, what did you see as the relation between this talk and your book? Yeah, so the inspiration um, for my book was uh, this new science coming out and a imaginary vision of a warehouse full of babies growing in um, artificial wombs. So I wrote from that visual. Got it. Well, thank you very much for being with us today, Thais. Thank you, Brady. And next up, please welcome a professor from University of Amherst, Sandy Litchfield. Thank you, Brady. I'm happy to be here. Uh, so I work as an artist and a curator and an assistant professor, associate professor, sorry, I just got tenure, <laughs> at um, University of Massachusetts in Amherst. I teach courses that lie at the intersection of art, architecture, design, and writing. This project began in response to a series of questions. First, if mistakes are gifts we give ourselves to learn, then what will we learn collectively from the mistakes that we as a civilization are making now? And what will civilization even look like in a thousand years? Finally, how can artists, writers, scientists, and other informed imaginarians come together and help shape a future in which civilization is understood as a fully entwined terrestrial entity? On Distant Keys is a transdisciplinary platform for generating speculative futures in the wake of climate change. With a virtual twist and playful shake, it attempts to confront and reckon with the precarious nature of our planet's future. As sea levels rise and coastal shores flood, On Distant Keys imagines the birth and rise of a new baby island. The island begins as a volcanic seamount deep in the North Atlantic. In a massive volcanic eruption, the seamount breaks the ocean surface in the year 2066. Life shows up pretty quickly after that, and within a thousand years of evolution, there are rivers and lakes, settlements and cities, and forests and farms. Now in this future tale, places are the main characters. They are sentient beings that have rights, and they are intricately entwined with all the organic and mineral elements that inhabit it, including humans, animals, insects, tree, moss, and stone. The stories emerge from a practice called futuring. So what is futuring? Futuring is an informed act of the imagination. It is plural. There is not one future, there are many. It is democratic and inclusive of many voices from around the world. Futuring is also playful. It's open and it's adaptable, um, but it's at the same time very analytical and aware. It collects and analyzes information from the past present to create stories about possible, probable, and preferred futures. The process of futuring and that allows for the intuitive. It emphasizes the atmospheric and the ambient over certainty and solution. This essential ambiguity maintains a kind of mystery in the process. The project has two platforms for storytelling. There's the Fabula, which is a future fiction set in the year 3000, and the Chronica, which is a diagrammatic timeline that extends from 1000 to 3000 CE. The Fabula is a nonlinear narrative that is more poetic and spatial, and it takes the form as of a map depicting this future island called Andaka. The chronica, uh, which is a word that comes from chronos, which means the personification of time, is a more linear and sequential mode of storytelling. Now, when you're piecing together past and future events in a timeline, you would think that the past events would be much more evident and objective than the future ones. But actually, they're both stories with various degrees of data and facts to support them. 
Even the present is a story that we construct from our perceptions, our observations, and our interpretations of what is both known and unknown. So this project seeks to uncover those stories by assembling a diverse team of scholars, artists, designers, writers, and activists who engage in this practice of futuring. Here we tell stories by listening to our past and future selves, the future island, the future ocean, the future river. We draw pictures and we tell stories of our becoming. How shall we become the lake and the forest? How shall we become the city that lives with the forest and the ocean and the whale? And how can we extend the notion of civility to include the ecosystem? As the orchard Watesi describes, it's an unreasonable season full of reckless pollination. But if this feverish field of folly can inoculate the poppy with a veritable poem, you will find the nerve to stand at the edge of green and go. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy. Using fiction has always been a great way to make the future. What's your favorite sci-fi or future looking book? Um, I really like Ur Ursula K. Le Guin's Always Coming Home. Um, and I also like Octavia Butler's um, Parable of the Sower. Those are really my two favorite. Thank you very much for being with us today, Sandy. Happy to be here. And here to talk about landscapes is Jose Julio Zerpa Rodriguez. Gracias. Conocemos todos el concepto de espacio-tiempo, sin embargo, la de tiempo-espacio es prácticamente desconocida. Los geólogos, los arqueólogos, trabajan con frecuencia con un concepto muy parecido. El volcán, los volcanes del occidente de México nos pueden servir precisamente para desarrollar esta teoría. Sí, somos capaces de quedarnos quietos, observar el territorio, imaginar el pasado, reconstruir lo que creemos que puede llegar a ser el futuro. Y todo esto a través del bloque de Jalisco. El bloque de Jalisco es una región ge geológica y geográfica con forma de diamante. Precisamente nos explica gran parte de la actividad sísmica y volcánica del occidente de México a lo largo de los milenios, con una serie de volcanes muy reconocibles. Las comunidades que más me interesan a mí para trabajar ese aspecto son dos, los huicholes, el pueblo originario, y los científicos de la Tierra, en más concretamente los geofísicos contemporáneos. Antes, antes existía el concepto mesoamericano de la montaña florida. Antes de llegar a los españoles, este lugar era donde residía Tlaloc, podía ser también la residencia de Tlaloc o Tlalocán, además de mantener un reservorio de agua fresca. Podemos intentar aterrizar estas ideas y quizás encontrarlo parecido en el territorio ritual y religioso de los huicholes, el llamado Kiekari, que tiene una forma también de, de diamante, donde practican gran parte de su religión y ancestrales. Según Telles, los cantos ceremoniales que guían el viaje espiritual a, a la tierra adentro incluyen la mención de sitios o sentimientos huicholes aparecidos o son inaccesibles hoy en día. Algunos de estos sitios han sido destruidos, saqueados, forman parte ahora de ranchos, plantaciones mineras, campos de cultivo, aunque las personas sagradas los huicholes o la, la autoridad espiritual pueden soñar con esos sitios y volver a encontrarlos. Precisamente uno de ellos es considerado, según una serie de testimonios, como un antiguo volcán. En la cumbre del mismo se podían encontrar los espíritus de los fallecidos, de los dioses antiguos y de los niños por nacer, que atravesaban. En el siglo XIX, eh, Santos Coy, un académico, creyó encontrar el Mictlán, el, el, el infierno azteca, eh, precisamente en lo que sería el bloque Jalisco, leyendo sobre cultos prehispánicos y coloniales en el área de Tepic. El infierno iría desde Tepic hasta Colima, siguiendo literalmente la frontera de lo que hoy sabemos son mmm, las líneas y los límites científicos del bloque de Jalisco. Las dificultades del alma se corresponden con esos sitios. Nos, esto nos lleva a una serie de, de preguntas traemos los sitios mitológicos con nosotros y los aterrizamos en la Tierra, es la Tierra la que nos va explicando cómo pueden ser siempre o 
tenemos que ir estar cargando con los países de las civilizaciones antiguas sin poder renunciar a ellos. En el siglo XIX, la actividad del Seboruco y del volcán de Colima llevó un nuevo interés por los estudios geofísicos. Eh, por ejemplo, esta imagen del volcán de Colima es una de las primeras fo fotografías de, del mismo, como parte de ese tipo de reconocimiento. Los geofísicos tienen también una conexión emocional y espiritual con el territorio. Sebotanol, por ejemplo, soñó que su alma se apoderaba de una nube en el volcán de Colima y atravesaba el género volcánico en dirección al Caribe para intentar llegar a Polonia, su, su hogar. El último artículo de Phil Vegan trató sobre la caldera primavera, que se encuentra bajo, un nombre, bajo el bosque de, del mismo nombre, que puede ser un riesgo real para un amplio área del occidente de México. Y sin embargo, antes de desarrollar estos riesgos, en el mismo artículo, Vegan hizo un breve recuento de los estudios sobre los yacimientos precolombinos y de sus condiciones geológicas, como la adaptación de Uchitlán en el volcán de Tequila, cuyo descubrimiento supuso la definición de los límites de Mesoamérica. La donación del ingeniero Solórzano Barreto forma el núcleo del, del Museo de Paleontología de Guadalajara. Su hijo paga tributo a los sueños eh, y pensando en el momento en el que un cambio radical llevaría a la humanidad a una racionalidad utópica. En el largo ahora, el espacio-tiempo es el concepto principal, viajamos a través del tiempo, nos, nosotros, nuestras comunidades, pero no se está explorando la manera en que podemos construir las regiones tiempo espaciales o cómo se están construyendo y se han ido desarrollando a lo largo del tiempo. Dentro de unas decenas de miles de años, el bloque Jalisco se puede convertir en una isla dirigiéndose hacia el norte. Quizás en ese momento podemos volver a reunirnos nosotros, nuestros descendientes, y conversar sobre todo lo que nos ha permitido entender lo que es Jalisco a lo largo del tiempo. Y por último, me gustaría dar las gracias a mis compañeros por haberme ayudado a organizar estas ideas, las imágenes, y darle un sentido a los paisajes del tiempo, al pasado, presente, el futuro, incluyendo el paraíso. Gracias. Gracias, Jose. Thank you so much for uh, doing that for us. And uh, would you mind sharing, what's your favorite volcanic landscape? Pienso que el volcán de Colima, pero también el volcán Tequila y su, y su área circundante da mucho juego por toda la cuestión de los yacimientos de obsidiana, los intentos que hay por mantener la miner los estudios arqueológicos y encontrar estos yacimientos, preservarlos, el desarrollo industrial de, del tequila. Es una región muy rica, muy interesante y que todavía tiene mucho futuro. Gracias, José. Y ahora, joining us from Down Under, please welcome Adam Long. Take it away. Hello from Australia. And yes, with a last name like Long, it was nominative determinism that I would be here with the Long Now Foundation. Have you ever wondered why it is that when somebody sneezes, everybody immediately says, bless you, even if they're not religious, even if they don't know the person, even if they're somewhere inappropriate, like a cinema. And the reason that happens is because of a story that was told hundreds of years ago that a sneeze was the soul escaping and bless you, pushes it back in. Stories influence our behavior. They change the way we think and the way we interact with the world. But in the modern world, stories are being told mainly by this group, marketers. Just ask Naomi Klein. Because marketers are putting so much effort into repeating stories over and over again, they're infiltrating our psyche, our culture, and our very infrastructure. So today, I want to take you through three examples of how marketers have really ruined the long now. That's right. They've taken some stories and done some real damage with how those stories have spread. We'll start by going back to the 1920s. Here's a typical street scene in the 1920s for New York. The street was a place for people to live, play, commerce, socialize, and then came the car. Suddenly, the street started to get dangerous. And as pedestrian deaths mounted, public outcry grew. A couple of states got together and said, let's put some speed limiters on this confounding contraption so they can't go faster than 15 miles an hour. Now, the motor industry didn't like the sounds of that. They wanted to drive fast. So they came up with a solution. These guys. Now, in Australia, we'd call them a bogan. Some call them hicks. Some call them yokels. But at the time, they called them jays. Jays were someone who came from the countryside and didn't know how to act in the city. They became the first jaywalkers. And the idea of jaywalking is that instead of people dying because of reckless drivers, people are dying because of reckless pedestrians. That term, that story has changed the very fabric of our cities. 
not just blaming the pedestrians for their deaths, but also deciding where people can and can't walk. Who's at fault when something happens? Can you imagine if the story was different and we talked about Jay drivers instead of Jay walkers? What might our cities look like with a different story? Now, around the same time in the 20s, tobacco companies noticed that there weren't as many women as men who were smoking. Only 3% of women were smokers, while nearly 60% of men were. So they hired a PR firm led by someone called Edward Bernays, who happened to be the nephew of Sigmund Freud. Like all good marketers, he looked for influencers. Who will the market look up to? Now, at the time, suffragettes were in full swing in first wave feminism. These were the people that women were looking up to. So he teamed up with them, and at the Easter parade of 1927, he got women to light cigarettes and call them torches of freedom, turning the act of lighting and smoking a cigarette from a dirty habit into something underpinning feminism. Now, if that's not a compelling story, I don't know what is. Who wouldn't want to support feminism? But the damage was done. You can see that by the time uh, this started came through, eight times as many women were smoking as there were in 1927 when that first story around cigarettes being tortures for freedom first infiltrated our culture. Now, do you want to accept this cookie? Probably you do. I expect you accept many every single day. And this is another example where perhaps just using a different term, a different story for cookies, we'd end up somewhere different. Now, the term cookies was invented by Lou Montelli, based on fortune cookies, where some code was trapped inside some other code and, and hidden. But what it means is that these cookies infiltrate and extract our data. They follow us around the internet. And if you think we're protected by privacy policies, well, on the left there, you can see the pink one is Instagrams. I'm sure we all read and agreed to that one. And on the right, you can see just how much data, when printed, Facebook collects on a single individual. So the question I have for you is, what would our state of privacy look like if instead of calling them cookies, we called them something else? Maybe creepy tracking code that watches you, just like someone watching you walk around a mall. Perhaps our attitudes to privacy would be very, very different. But there is hope because knowing that stories can do damage means we can also elevate the stories that do help. And there have been plenty of examples of those throughout history as well. There's the wave of uh, minimalism, which has really been championed by the likes of Patagonia saying, don't buy this jacket. Or think of all the stories that were told to make germ theory a reality and get people to start doing things as simple as washing their hands. Or think about the movement of social enterprises that are, are turning what people wear into a statement for what they believe in, uh, like Conscious Step, my own company. So there is hope. As long as we're mindful and choiceful about the stories we tell, we can shape the long now for the better. Don't let the marketers do more damage. Thanks, Adam. Uh, I'm wondering, do you see any examples of a potential marketing ruin happening right now? One that we won't <laughs> see the effects of for a long time? Oh, yeah, they're, they're coming in, in all the time, aren't they? Uh, there's a question around, will the metaverse be an equivalent to the world we live in outside, for example? Uh, there are stories around whether our our destiny uh, lies in space or whether our destiny is, is solving the, the problems here. So that, that's an interesting one, the, fal the false dichotomy saying, do we go to space or do we fix the problems here on Earth? Uh, marketers need to solve that one and get people thinking long term uh, and not get distracted by the short term thinking. All right. Well, thanks for joining us, Adam. And Thank you very much. Glad to be here. Later. And now, please welcome Bay Area artist, Linda Gass. Take it away. Thank you for having me here. This is a story about how an experimental temporary land art installation turned into a permanent living artwork through the power of community engagement. I'm an environmental activist and an artist, and I combine the two to make artwork about climate change, water, and land use. My approach is to use beauty to encourage people to look at the hard issues we face. I'm inspired by the connections between humans and the water and the land that we need to survive. Several years ago, I was awarded an artist residency and I ventured outside of my comfort zone to create, create a community engaged artwork in a new open space park in a low income, racially and culturally diverse city in the San Francisco Bay Area. The open space park is called Cooley Landing and it's located in the city of East Palo Alto. 
This is a bird's eye view of Cooley Landing today, but this peninsula of land hasn't always been here. 200 years ago, the area was lush wetlands, but from 1932 to 1960, those wetlands were filled with garbage when it was a San Mateo County landfill. Lead, mercury, PCBs, and other toxins were all dumped here. Today, Cooley Landing is a new public park. The toxic landfill has been capped with six feet of clean soil. Native species have returned and they're thriving. And there's a beautiful new education center. I invited the local community to participate in creating a temporary land art installation at Cooley Landing to mark the former shoreline of the wetlands with blue plastic survey whiskers. The plan was to leave the installation there for a month. I used this United States Coastal Survey map of San Francisco Bay from 1857 to locate the former shoreline of Cooley Landing. You can see the pier that was the original Cooley Landing surrounded by extensive wetlands. By placing this map over a recent satellite image, I could locate the former shoreline relative to the present day features. The placement of the installation is highlighted in blue and it avoids habitat areas for endangered species. On installation days, I marked the former shoreline with orange flagging tape. And then the community placed the blue survey whiskers along this line by hammering them into the ground with five inch nails. And people of all ages participated. Here's a view of part of the final installation. The entire artwork is over 500 feet long and used 2000 survey whiskers. The community loved it and asked if I could create a permanent installation, but without the plastic. I thought it would be really cool to replace the survey whiskers with native plants, but I had no idea what to plant. So I consulted a local restoration nonprofit and they suggested native juncus. And together we created a new project called the Living Shoreline. Juncus is a reed that's blue green in color and it grows upright. So it was a perfect replacement for the blue plastic survey whiskers. It also has very good long-term survival characteristics. It's drought tolerant and it grows in meadow or wetland environments. Cooley Landing and nearby East Palo Alto are vulnerable to the impact of sea level rise. So the adaptability of Juncus is important. As a wetland plant, it helps reduce the impact of sea level rise by absorbing rising tides. Over the past five years, community volunteers have helped to plant and maintain the juncus. On weekends, individuals and families came out to plant and many returned to check on how it's grown. During the week, we invited school classrooms to participate. They ranged in age from kindergartners to high school students. I was touched to see these young children so focused on planting the juncus. They were so careful and gentle with the plants. We also worked with high school students from six different local high schools, and we spent three hours giving them hands-on experience with wetlands restoration, sea level rise science, and land art. And everyone got to plant some juncus. This is the installation a year after it was planted. I want to give a shout out to my partners in this project, Grassroots Ecology, the Mid Peninsula Regional Open Space District and the city of East Palo Alto. And thanks to the Palo Alto Arts Center as well. The other day I was looking at Cooley Landing and Google Earth and I realized that the installation is now visible from space. It's been really rewarding to collaborate with the community and with living plants. At this point, nature is in charge of the artwork and the juncus continues to mature as you can see in this recent photo. If you like this project and wanna see more, visit my website or find me on social media. Thank you so very much for this opportunity to share this with you. Linda, thank you so much for being with us today. What, uh, can you share another of your favorite natural art pieces? Oh, that's a really good question. This is actually the first one that I've done with plants. I've done other land art installations in the landscape using textiles. And I really love collaborating with the other species of plants. So I want to do more of that. If someone wanted to do a similar project, how should they approach it? Well, it's really important to get the community buy-in. I did a lot of presentations at city council meetings and collaborating with these different government agencies in order to make it happen. 
And so I think that's the most important part. And then also really understanding the appropriateness of the plants that you're using for the environment that you're working in. You don't want something that's going to uh, take over uh, another landscape. Um, you want it to be compatible with that. Yeah. So first community, then plants. Yes. <laughs> All right. Well, cool. Thank you so much, Linda. Oh, thanks for having me. This is so nice to be here. And now I'd like to welcome back a veteran Ignite speaker. Take it away, Jason Crawford. Thank you, Brady. Humanity has had a pretty good run so far. In the last 200 years, world GDP per capita has increased by almost 14 times. But as they say, past performance may not be indicative of future results. Can growth continue? One argument against long-term growth is that we will run out of resources. Malthus worried about running out of farmland. Jevons warned that Britain would run out of coal, and Hubbard called peak oil. Fears of shortages lead to fears of overpopulation. If resources are static, then they have to be divided into smaller and smaller shares for more and more people. In the 1960s, this led to dire predictions of famine and depredation. But predictions of catastrophic shortages virtually never come true. Agricultural productivity has grown faster than Malthus realized was possible, and oil production, after a temporary decline, recently hit an all-time high. One reason for this is that predictions of shortages are based on conservative estimates from only proven reserves. Uh, another is that when a resource really is running out, we transition off of it, as in the 1800s we switched our lighting from whale oil to kerosene. But the deeper reason is that there's really no such thing as a natural resource. All resources are artificial. They are a product of technology. And economic growth is ultimately driven not by material resources, but by ideas. In the 20th century, the crucial role of ideas was confirmed by formal economic models. The economist Robert Solow was studying how output per worker increases as we accumulate capital, such as machines and factories. Now, what he found was there are diminishing returns to capital accumulation alone. A single worker who's given two machines can't be twice as productive. So if technology is static, output per worker soon stops growing. But technology acts as a multiplier on productivity. This makes each worker more productive and creates more headroom for capital accumulation. So we can have economic growth if and only if we have technological progress. Now, how does this happen? Well, another economist, Paul Romer, pointed out the key feature of ideas. In economic terms, they are non-rival. Unlike a loaf of bread or a machine, an invention or an equation can be shared by everyone. Now, if we double the number of workers we have and double the machines they use, we will merely double their output, which is the same output per worker. But if we also double the power of technology, we will more than double output, making everyone richer. Physical resources have to be divided up, so as the population grows, the per capita stock of resources shrinks. But ideas do not. The per capita stock of ideas is the total stock of ideas. So we won't run out of resources as long as we keep generating new ideas. But will we run out of ideas? Now, Romer assumed that the technology multiplier would grow exponentially at a rate proportional to the number of researchers. But soon after that, another economist, Chad Jones, pointed out that in the 20th century, we have vastly increased R&D while growth rates have been flat or even declining. And this is evidence that ideas have been getting harder to find. Does this mean some inevitable stagnation? Maybe we've already picked all the low-hanging fruit. Maybe research is like mining for ideas and the vein is running thin. Maybe inventions are like fish in a pond and the pond is getting fished out. But notice something about all these metaphors. They all treat ideas like physical resources. And I think it's a mistake to call peak ideas, just as it seems to have always been a mistake to call peak resources. One reason for this, as Paul Romer pointed out, is that the space of ideas is combinatorially vast. The number of potential molecular compounds or the number of possible DNA sequences is astronomical. We have barely begun to explore.
And even as ideas get harder to find, we get better at finding them. As the population and the economy grow, we can devote more brains and more investment to R&D. And technologies like spreadsheets or the internet make researchers more productive. In fact, the greatest threat to long-term economic growth might be the slowdown in population growth. Without more brains to push technology forward, progress might stall. Now, that's a problem for another time. I've only got five minutes here. But note that in those five minutes, we've gone from worrying about overpopulation to underpopulation. And that's because we've traded a scarcity mindset where growth is limited by resources for an abundance mindset where it is limited only by our ingenuity. Thank you all, and uh, thanks to Brady and The Long Now for this opportunity. Thanks, Jason. Can you share the idea that you're most excited about? For future growth? Oh, there's so many. Um, but, you know, one of the biggest ones is longevity. If we can solve longevity, that gives us the time to solve uh, many, many other problems. And that would certainly solve the population problem. It would help, yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, Jason. Yeah. Well, that was just a great Ignite. I want to thank all of the speakers uh, for coming out and submitting themselves to this torturous uh, yet very efficient format. And I want to thank The Long Now. This is our nth time doing this together, and I really appreciate working with all of you, especially uh, everyone who touched this directly, Danielle, Justin, Andrew, Cameron, and Xander. And then finally, thanks to all of you. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the program. Let me know what you think. And if you want to do an Ignite, hit me up. Thank you, everyone. That was amazing. I really appreciate all of you joining us in this format and having so many member speakers be part of this series. I also want to thank our host, Brady Forrest, as well as our whole crew. Thank you so much. Have a good night. Mm -hmm.